ഒഴുക്കും Good morning, cybersecurity community, and welcome back to the Mile High City. We are here on day two of MYS in Denver, Colorado. My name is Savannah Peterson. Delighted to be hosting these fantastic conversations with John Furrier. John, what do you think has been the most unexpected topic this week? A ransomware. <laughs> I will say that we, we have okay. certainly fed our AI everything we could possibly create so it about ransomware. ransomware. I think, I think the, the topic that's not being talked about a lot is this next segment we're going to do about networking. There's such a holistic view end-to-end -end workloads up and down the stack from silicon to the application and everywhere in between has to be evaluated and detected and, and looked at. The data is getting, the corpus is getting bigger. It's real time. So I think we're in this inflection point, this wave. I think the big story is what's coming. There's a tsunami of more data, more telemetry, and then all these reasoning engines are coming out. So I think there's a, a blue sky around the corner, but right now it's like a little foggy. So a uh, little, little this cloudy. next segment I'm excited for because um, I think networking is where the answers are. Um, and I think that's always been the last area that gets worked on in my opinion. So when you see networking stuff happening, you know we're getting close to some good solutions. Speaking of good solutions, I am very excited to welcome Greg from Corelight to the States. Greg, thanks so much for being here with us. Hey, it's my honor. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah, what a joy. You are You are a threat hunter. You are an engaging person to chat with. Tell us, uh, before we dig in, what's going on at Corelight right now? You guys have been around for a while. I'm assuming the threat hunting landscape has evolved a bit. It's evolved a lot. And, um, you know, you were mentioning blue sky. I'm kind of a blue sky person. Uh, I'm an optimist. I think networking does provide. We need that in this yes. industry. It's we important. Need global. Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> just period in the <laughs> world. You know, a little more optimism. So I spend most of my career in the, in the national laboratory system at Lloyd's Berkeley National Lab, where the technology that Corelight is commercializing was invented and that where it first started to thrive. And then it kind of took off. It became, uh, it's open source tech. It became widely adopted all around the world. And the kind of the big idea of our company is that we're taking this, the techniques and tooling that elite defenders were using in, in the national app system and in DOD and DHS and democratizing it and making it available to the mere mortals of the Global 2000 and further down. And that's kind of the mission of the company and that's what we're up to. We do focus on network traffic, as you mentioned, uh, and that provides you know, breadth of visibility for organizations and it's an it's a increasingly important part of the landscape for defenders. So, first of all, I love democratizing security. It's been a bit of a theme that we've talked about here a lot. I think it really matters. I, it makes my human soul churn when I think of people being left out because of an economic situation or something else, or just not having access to those tools. Languages have been barriers. There's so many things that can stand in the way here. How do you, and I, I, maybe this is simple, but how do you get to unlock that insights and, and the learnings and the research from the DOD and from these bigger organizations to filter that out to the rest of us, to us mere mortals? Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's part of the quest of a lot of open source companies that is you take a power tool, something that's super configurable, super flexible, it's sometimes a platform, it's a toolkit, and you turn it into um, a product that's just as powerful, but has an easy mode. So it's easy for defenders to make use of immediately. Um, we produce masses of very programmable, extensible data and lots of detections, but we're also really careful to make sure beginners can, can make use of that immediately. Um, we have a new SaaS platform that is a big step in that direction. Uh, but the key thing and the tricky thing is to make sure that the export users can still uh, take advantage of what we offer. Great, yeah. I, wanna, I wanna get into the decade long um, journey you guys had as a startup, come, yeah. obviously came out of Berkeley, the tech alpha geeks kind of building out great tech and network uh, visibility. The cloud impact has been significant. I remember when early days on the cloud computing, it was like, oh, it's not secure. Now it's pretty damn secure. So how has the networking paradigm from your standpoint affected with cloud? Because they control a lot of traffic in and out of the cloud to on-prem and now that the edge is there. So obviously service area is a big concern in security. And guess what the packets run on? Network. So yeah. take us through the impact of cloud and where we are today and kind of what's the current situation relative to security networks position and, and role in that. I think the conventional wisdom a few years ago is that the cloud providers will take care of security and there'll be some kind of inherent boundary between on-prem workflows in the cloud. And most defenders have figured out they need to pay real attention to network security in the cloud, and attackers don't care about the difference. They don't care about yeah. whether you're in Azure or ECP or AWS. They're happy to pivot from your data center to AWS. 
our customers really appreciate that when they deploy our products in the cloud, they get the same format of data, they get the same sort of normative detections wherever they occur. We do adapt our products for the cloud and we enrich our data with context that's important for defenders in the cloud and we can do that differently for each cloud provider and differently for Kubernetes. It's been a journey. But I think the world is waking up to the fact that network yeah. telemetry, network detection is still really relevant in the cloud. Yeah, they'll never, it'll never be not relevant because networks and server networking and compute will always be around. Just at what form do they shape into? Yeah, the cloud is someone else's network <laughs> and there are different APIs for accessing it, different ways to monitor it, but it's still a critical ground truth uh, so yeah. that needs to be integrated into so modern So tell us through the relationship with Google with you guys. You're here at the show. Um, how are you guys working with them? And Google has a good network, so I'm sure you got a great relationship. What is the positioning with you guys and Google and what does that look like from a product, integration, you know, solution, value proposition? What's the benefit to the customers? Sure. Uh, it began, I would say first it began with, with Nandiant, and so our relationship started with Nandiant even before the acquisition, and there's a lot of common culture and common heritage with Mandiant. XFed, mission-oriented to the core, you know, so we feel the Mandia team is sort of our kind of people, and I think it's mutual. Um, we began working with them to integrate our network sensors into their service offerings. You know, they're the people you call you know, if something really bad happens, if, if you've been breached by, you know, the FBI just announced yesterday the takedown of this Fox Typhoon botnet, and uh, big news, one of the big uh, headlines from the last couple of days, and so, if, if you had been breached by uh, you know, some fearsome nation state backed botnet like that, you might call Mandia to figure out how bad is it? When did it happen? How, how can I get rid of it? And once I'm rid, how will I know that uh, you know, I'm fully remediated? And when they go through that process, they need network telemetry and network data. So they partnered with us to provide the technologies through that entire workflow. Now we're fully integrated into managed defense, one of their offerings, which means we can you can be yes, this is the official integration. The official integration. Congratulations! It's very exciting. exciting. We're really yeah. excited. And and so when they go to do, you know to do their investigations, they can use our technology, and that technology is fully integrated into their solution stack, including SecOps, formerly known as Chronicle, including Virus Total, their Intel offerings. It's all one um, highly integrated package. We're excited to be able to deliver it together. I love that, you know, you're, and, and it is exciting, and it's nice that all these tools can come together. This actually parlays into something I was going to talk to you about. You mentioned these end-to-end -end workflows, doesn't matter if you're in the cloud, on-prem, what's going on, you're able to help folks out. This comes down to a user experience game, yeah. and having a really congruent user experience game. How much, it feels like that must be a priority for you with all your partners and making sure that your customers are able to easily, to your point, have that easy button, or yeah. easy mode at least, or congruent mode across systems to be able to identify and get context as quick as possible. Yeah, I think this is a very underappreciated aspect yes. of cybersecurity. Um, and it's also, maybe we'll talk about AI at some point, but it's a big part of how you integrate AI into tooling. The user experience is almost as important as the AI um, capabilities. Uh, for us, we talk to so many customers who are disappointed at having to rely on dozens of tools. We talk about the chair swivel effect of going from one tool to another. And from the beginning, we've tried to just integrate seamlessly into our customers' preferred architectures. So if it's SecOps or Chronicle, that's great. Also, um, there are other potential SIMs or XDRs or data lakes, and we want to make sure that the data and detections we produce are valuable wherever and however customers want to consume them. I don't want to speak ill of potential competitors, but often they don't have that view. They want to sort of lock up the eyeballs into one interface. I, th I think because we were operators and we consumed a lot of uh, you know products 15 years ago, um, we don't believe that's the way to build. Security. Give some examples of some customer wins or examples of where you guys have made an impact and influenced the outcome of, with your data and your intelligence from the network side. Give some uh, use cases, share with us the key areas and, and examples. Yeah, there's a few sort of classic use cases. One of them is just ROI, TCO, like we can take legacy network sensors, four or five different kinds and wrap them up, integrate them into one traditional sensor, and we can, um, we can basically say that in itself is a really great. Okay, no one wants to deal with their legacy systems and make it easier. And if you're going to do that for me, that's awesome. Yeah, it's not kind of the sexiest thing we can talk about. Um, it's not directly confronting makers with that. Very pragmatic. Yeah, and again, we're former operators, so we like yeah. the idea that we could say we'll take out four of those legacy tools, and you'll have one highly modern system that's data centric. So that's one. We also accelerate SOC workflows. We help the process of investigating detections be a lot more satisfying, like emotionally, to the SOC analyst, and also just a lot faster, which is satisfying 
testifying to the leadership yeah. chain as well. Um, we improved detection coverage. So, I, like in the last week, I've talked to CISOs of a major utility, a major bank, like top ten in, in both uh, globally in both sectors. They're both um, really concerned about visibility gaps. They know they have significant gaps in coverage, and we help close those gaps. So that's another use case. So, uh, you know, we do a lot of these Cuban interviews. We get a lot of data, very horizontally scalable observation space, as we call it. Yeah. Talk to a lot of experts. And the whole Gen AI wave, you hear all kinds of cliches. Um, uh, security for AI, AI for security, networking for AI, AI for networking. Um, and there's some, there's, there's some double-sided coin, I get that. It was yeah. not, I mean, it's cliche, I'm not really getting down on it. I appreciate that. But networking's hard, there's a lot of in install base. Yeah. You, know, you got the Cisco's and the Junipers, you got Arista network boxes, you have routes that have been established from the, from the early days of the internet. Yeah. So as networking is still, obviously the plumbing, it's still, I won't say it's antiquated, but it's networking, right? It's like plumbing. Yeah. yeah. You know, so how do you innovate in networks? If I'm a customer, I got an install base of a lot of Cisco gear, top of rack switches, I'm going through transformation now with NVIDIA and other powering new data centers and new cloud architectures, as that's going on, I got to run my security. Yeah. Where's the innovation with AI and networking? Like, and uh -huh. how, how should customers think about, because you know, so I see Cisco kind of trying to figure that out for themselves. Like, okay, parsing logs, okay, not really, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What's your, where's the innovation in networking with AI? Networking generally, um, it seems like every five years, there's a sort of, there's a, bold proposal to reinvent the internet architecture. Um, and but and so it's easy to get a little cynical and say it's never going to change. These architectures like TCP, IP have been around for 40 years. They're just not going to evolve. But in fact, gradually over time, it is gradually evolving into a more programmable infrastructure and with more automation. And I, I think LLMs and AI generally can be used to reduce errors in, in configuration. Um, and I, that Cisco's doing that, Juniper is doing that. There's some <coughs> low hanging fruit there. Again, it's not super sexy, but it might make networking more stable, easier to model. Um, and know, stuff that makes us more secure and less clunky is yeah. kind of sexy. Yeah. It, yeah, it doesn't have to have sequence on it to still be a sexy yeah, yeah. department, you know? No sequence, but impactful. Yeah. And you know, Cisco now has this bold new vision, Tom Gillis's vision of dissolving the difference between networking and security. So we're, I'm interested in that, like yeah. putting um, security as a function in the network. And we're, we're certainly compatible because we can take our product and put it in the yeah. Kubernetes environments, run it right in the network, and that's a neat idea. It's not here yet, but I'm again, I'm a blue sky person. I, I can imagine a future internet where the difference between networking systems, security, data analysis is dissolved. Oh, so you've run up Kubernetes twice now, so I have to go yeah. there. We go to KubeCon. I know, I've been smiling we, each time he does it, you know it. Yeah, every KubeCon, it's have all inception. Kubernetes stickers up here. Uh, we do have a lot of stickers. Yeah, yes. Cool, get you a Many of them are, yeah. Z sticker, you're looking for a sticker. Okay, you one over. You <laughs> Yeah, you can see my Kubernetes right here. <laughs> yeah, totally. I'm showing my open source cloud colors right now. Anyway, yeah. carry on. Oh, okay, yeah. oh, thanks. Um, <laughs> Is, is, is getting boring in a good way, it's getting stable, but there's still a lot more work to do in the cloud native, because now you have microservices, I mean, and the big conversation here in the security conferences, don't just adopt a tech stack and then not change your process. Right. So there's some still refactoring and redesign going on at the foundational levels up here. Yeah. How do you guys look at that Kubernetes world, how do you fit in, and what does that community need to do to be successful so people can start building and running large-scale workloads in Gen AI and security? Yeah, it's a great question because for a while, I think the Kubernetes community also didn't believe network security was that important, but it, that's beginning to change too. We can run in Kubernetes environments. We, as far as I know, we protect one of the largest Kubernetes clusters in the world right now, and it's, it's related to AI in some way, and we found a way to access traffic and to detect um, risk models that are relevant to this customer. So yeah. we've got that existence proof, and we're, moving, we're making great progress there. Do you guys attend KubeCon and the CNCF? Are you guys active in that community? We're not as much as we should. We submitted talks, um, but we haven't really penetrated that barrier. It's a, it's a we have, because we use Kubernetes internally um, it, uh, on our platform, it seems like a natural point yeah. of connection. We, we, we got to get you. Yeah, we're there. Salt Lake yeah. in November, Latvia in happy. the spring. Happy to do that. We'll have to make the magic happen. No, I think, okay. I think that's, that's a lot of overlap. Time. We should submit a talk. Well, we got oh, oh, yeah. Kubernetes, that's the most under talked topic here. Well, no, I, not anymore. I, well, exactly, <laughs> and I, but, I, but I, I do think it's relevant. I think what you were talking about is also really pertinent in the sense that when we were figuring out how we were going to 
be working with containers in the future and what that platform was going to be and even determining what, if it was going to be Kubernetes that went out and won, security right. was a little bit deprioritized right. in that moment because it was, can we, I almost just swore, can we uh, reduce the complexity right. of, of, of this situation and actually make this a little bit easier for, for folks to use at scale? I do think it's really interesting now to think about, we are there, it is at the enterprise, you're able to support that. Yep. What are some of the, actually this is fun, what are some of the bigger threat risks specifically for containers and containerized applications? Well, uh, apps, malicious apps can break out of containers. Yeah, so there's a new class of risks like lateral movement between containers and so you need visibility and detection and some. Uh, you need to be attuned to those risk models to be able to provide value. There's also just a lot of, a lot of Kubernetes clusters host web applications that are under constant attack, and so you can provide visibility and even, in some cases, depending on the architecture of decrypted traffic, because Kubernetes often has to decrypt to load balance. So there's there's an example where network monitoring can actually be better in a Kubernetes environment than it is outside a Kubernetes environment. So there's, it, it, there's various nice applications I'll say one more thing, because our data is open source in origin, it's programmable, it's extensible, it's easy for us to add Kubernetes context to the logs we produce. We can say, this, this uh, log or this detection can, um, can append the pod ID or other Kubernetes metadata that makes it a lot easier for an incident responder to say, oh, I know exactly what caused that. So that's the, that's the beauty of open source and of a community working together. Two follow-up questions there, because I, I love open source, and then I have actually, from our community, we had a great question come in this morning on LinkedIn. How important is the open source community to security and our cybersecurity future? I think it's critical. I mean, a lot of the fundamental building blocks of our products, um, and, that's, and, and also of civil society, um, are come from open source communities. Um, it's also the culture of open source that's important. It's not just the development model, but it's the idea that we're in this together, we have common interests, we can form common cause, it's easier for us to do that than attackers because they often have, the exception may be nation state attackers, set them aside for a second, but for the criminal attackers, they're also competing with each other. And so as defenders, if we can just break down some troublesome cultural boundaries or barriers, we can work together and open source is one mechanism for doing that. A third thing, open source is really good for people from non-traditional backgrounds who want to advance their careers because they can get access to completely free tooling, technology, and training um, to go faster. And, to, and, and our CISO, Bernard Bramley, is a great example of that. Uh, he's, he's terrific. It'd be a good interview subject in the future for a year for it. Yeah. 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 He, and he's, he's just a great um, poster person for that phenomenon. What did they pick? One other question I just want to follow up there because I, I, I thought this was really interesting. One of our community members chimed in about this and, and seeing that security could be the catalyst for AI adoption at the enterprise. Yeah. Do you think that that might be one of the verticals that drives true adoption and making it real, not just these test cases and hype curve moments we're experiencing right now? It could be. I mean, we were among the first to... Uh, to were we alerted to the, to the potential of LLMs to... Um, do good for our customers, buy our customers. That was super interesting, and it's a byproduct of being open source. So, just a few months after you know the the big hype wave um, around LLMs, so now about a year and a half ago, at a customer advisory panel, we learned that one of our customers, a big hedge fund, was already using LLMs to make sense of our data and to help their analysts analyze it. And that's because we are open source, and so the LLMs had all, already been trying oh, cool. our data for 20 years. So we are very quick to be able to wow. integrate that. Yeah, it's kind of a neat, it's a, it's a And that's an adoption story. I mean, the fact yeah. that somebody was already there, you know, what a fun way to find out. Of yeah, that's an example of not having a closed black box approach, but being open to input from the community and from our customers, and we were pretty quickly, and by the way, the use case was Stuff. Seemingly simple, but actually really cool. It's explainability. So please explain this log or explain this detection rule. It's something that helps a junior analyst become, just punch above their weight, move faster, be happier. So we've incorporated a lot of little features like that. Again, using thoughtful user experience design, yeah. uh, into our products now. Oh my goodness, wow. Well, I think this is cool. We covered a lot of things I wasn't expecting yeah. to cover in this one. I know, I was waiting, looking for more. We yeah. had to follow up. <laughs> yeah. We don't have enough time. I was going to answer cyber resilience because that's been a definition. How would you, real quick, how would you define <laughs> cyber resilience? It's the ability to, you sort of have to assume breach, and it's the ability to respond to a whole variety of potential um, bad outcomes gracefully. And maybe not, you know, maybe not 
in a completely Teflon way, but to be able to do the best you can, given the, the cards that you're dealt. It's not going to be the same if you are, if, if a, like an amateur hacker versus a nation state attacker, the resili resilience is the ability to do the best you can. in, in Bowser, your, thank yeah. you. Well, we're all just trying to do the best we can. Exactly. Craig, you're clearly leading the way. We love to hear more about you and the team at Coralite. We got to get you to KubeCon. Hey, I'd like to do that. I, I will bring you a to team really to fun. Okay. Yes, please do. Yes, please do. I will. I will display it proudly. We really appreciate you taking the time Thank Thank and you. dropping some serious knowledge, John. What a fantastic interview. We could have sat here for an hour with it. Yeah. Easily. We went off down the KubeCon rabbit hole there. I know. I know. It's all good. I got a little excited. I got a little excited yeah. there. That was, that was. <laughs> I hope we're all getting excited at home or wherever you might be watching on this beautiful rock. We're here in Denver, Colorado at. My name is Savannah Peterson. You're watching The Cube, the leading source for cybersecurity news.